Continuing on, we're going to talk about memory some more. I hope you like memory. I like memory. Because we're going to be talking about memory a lot. And it's worth noting that memory and the management of it is a very complicated topic and is one that is under frequent debate and or discussion in the world of computing in general. Certainly computer science, computing, whatever you want to say. Efficient management of it is critical for any advanced system. And every modern operating system includes extremely complicated memory management or memory managers and all kinds of support mechanisms for it. And that is no accident because as we stated in this just prior now or just prior and in a previous video as well, it's a critical component of any system. So we're going to scratch the surface of memory a little bit more than we have here. We're going to step into the rabbit hole a little bit, a little bit more than we did or have up to, up to now. And we're certainly going to go deeper down the rabbit hole as the series progresses and that is to be expected. So it's important that we are comfortable with what we are saying in each episode and video in the series because as we move forward we're going to do nothing but build on what we've already talked about discussed and hopefully learned so let's ask ourselves what is memory but perhaps more important before we can even ask ourselves that question we're going to ask ourselves a more important question what is memory used for so as we illustrated in a prior video Memory is used for pretty much every part of an application or a process, any kind of data. And we could sort of make the more general statement by saying that memory is used for storing values. And we could be, we can be a little less general or depending on your perspective, more general by saying that it's used for storing any type of value. So what exactly do we mean by that? It could be text, as it is here. It could be numbers. It could be pictures. I don't know, um, pictures. Some sample pictures. So this picture of penguins is, in fact, it's just data. And it's just this image right now is somehow represented in memory. doesn't matter how it is, but... Memory is being used to display this picture, and to be clear, it's not just, when we say memory in this context, we don't just mean, you know, oh, we're using hard drive space because it's a file. <clears throat> Looking at it in Windows Photo Viewer, this picture is in, in physical memory in RAM right now as it's being displayed on our screen. And so we can also say that the whole desktop is in memory. So our wallpaper the taskbar, you know, pretty much anything that you see on your computer monitor, that's all being stored in memory as well. Pretty much anything and everything is stored in memory. And so memory has to be extremely flexible to fit pretty much any possible use that anyone could ever think up. And luckily it is. And more to the point, for each use of memory, there has to be some sort of standard for storing and retrieving information, which is to say that if a program wants to store information in a specific way or store some kind of information, there should be a standard for storing that information in the event that it ever needs to share that information with another program or process. Um, or send it across a network or any kind of transmission of data. There needs to be standards for certain basic types of data and how that is stored so that other applications can understand it. So just in a very simple example, we might say that, well, we have application A and application B, and for whatever reason, they need to communicate some sort of data. So we'll just say that that data is the number 10. If application A and application B don't have a way of agreeing 
on what how that data and how the number 10 is stored they'll never be able to send that data back and forth because they'll never understand what the other person is trying to say it's very analogous um to um to different dialects or languages verbal languages you know chinese and english if you don't know chinese and they don't know english it's gonna be very difficult to understand each other and so that's sort of it's no different in the realm of computers or uh, programs as the case may be so as we said there needs to be some standards for what for storing basic types of data and as a matter of fact these standards have already been developed and they're generally referred to as data types we're not going to get all into data types a whole lot or really at all in um, in this video but we will go to Wikipedia bring up the page and read the little blurb in computer science and computer programming a data type or simply type is a classification identifying one of various types of data such as real integer or boolean that determines the possible values for that type the operations that can be done on values of that type the meaning of the data and the way the values of that type can be stored mostly what we talked about is that last part but again this is a uh, data types is something that we will deal with fairly heavily as the series goes on just by necessity because again it's there's standards for storing data and those standards are called data types and so when you start messing around in memory with cheat engine or any other memory editor for that matter it pays to know how these types are stored because when you want to start manipulating that data the programs or programs expect the data to be stored in those standard ways and if you manipulate that data in non-standard ways they get very confused and bad things happen such as they crash and you lose all your progress and you get frustrated so again data types the standards for storing data we will, we will touch more on this as the series goes but for now it's enough to say that there are stand there are standard ways of storing certain kinds of data regardless of how programs actually use memory they're required to go through the operating system to get it we've talked a bit about this and we're going to talk a bit more about it because it's very important the OS is the arbiter of all physical memory in the system it, when the OS first boots up it is notified or it finds out in some mysterious magical way about how much physical memory is in the system and then part of the process of the OS starting up is it initializes its memory manager and it divides up that memory and however it wants to and then it assigns that memory out to whoever needs it and it reserves some of it for itself for a variety of internal uses it's responsible for delegating who gets memory when they get it and so on and so forth and so that's all we're really going to say for now about in regards to how the OS manages memory but we'll come back to that more relevant to the programs themselves is how they handle memory not so much the operating system but how individual programs deal with it and it's enough for us to acknowledge you know, without going into incredible detail it's enough for us to say that um, programs manage memory in discrete units one might is what we will call them it's not the units are basically data sizes and it will get to that so um, you might be familiar with the bit the byte um, things like that um, and again these are topics that we'll cover but again at this point it's enough to say that programs divide up their memory in a, in a fairly granular way so as an example a program might be running or a process might be running and it will say I need a chunk of memory for a number and the uh, it'll go to the operating system and say I I, uh, I need memory so you know I have a number 10 I, I need memory for it the operating system says okay and then it runs a bit more and then it says you know what I have another number uh, we'll go 42 and it goes to the operating system it says I need memory to store this uh, number 42 and the operating system says fine and it gives it memory and then it runs a bit more and then it says I need more memory for the name of the player in this game you know so not notepad but uh say you're playing a game the player's name will be in another discrete chunk of memory 
And then a, yet another chunk of memory will probably have the player, you know, the current score. Another discrete chunk will have the current lives. Another discrete chunk will have how many bullets they have, so on and so forth. And yet even another another chunk of memory will have the graphics that are currently being displayed on your screen, similar to how we talked about the desktop. That's all in memory as well. It's no different when you're playing a 3D game. All the textures and everything that you're looking at in the game, that's all in memory. So in the event that you want to sit down and write an aimbot or something like that, um, all that stuff's in memory. You just need a way of telling a cheat engine, in, in our case, how to interpret that the data in memory and you know how to do what you want it to do. In this case, lock onto the nearest enemy and shoot them in the head or something of that sort. So again, all of this is possible with the realm of, me of memory editing because all of these things are in memory. It's just, can you find them, can you interpret them, and can you manipulate them in the proper way? Um, it's worth noting that even the sound is, is passing through memory at some point. It's probably a little harder to manipulate just because it's fairly transient and opaque, I guess one might say, but it is there somewhere. This is not, the granularity with which games and programs and whatnot manage memory is not an accident. It's just a function of how programs are written and how memory management works. So, as you're writing a program, you use it, there's, it's very divergent and one might say very distributed. Um, it's not necessarily tightly knit. So, I mean, it's hard to anticipate what your memory needs will be five seconds from now. So as a result, you have a whole bunch of, um, generally the scenario is that you have a whole bunch of small requests for, um, for memory. So I need a little bit of memory, I need a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Okay, I'm done, I'll give up this, I'll give up that, but I need more now. So very rarely will an application be able to, or a program or whatever you have, what have you, very rarely will it be able to anticipate its memory needs and mass beforehand especially if it's interacting with a user because you there's no way to know what the user will do um, so the way that memory allocation works in programs and applications is generally it's very event driven or and by event driven it just means whatever the user does or it depends on what the user does so if they click the mouse on a particular button, then the program will allocate memory and, and behave one way, whereas if the user clicks on another button, then they will allocate different memory and behave a different way. So um, very hard to anticipate memory needs. In the context of Cheat Engine, though, it, this is kind of nice because the granularity with which they deal with memory makes it fairly easy for us to be specific about the kind of information we want to find. So in the previous example, we or one of the previous videos, we had typed in uh, "hello world," I think it was, and we had were able to find the word the word "hello." So the more information you add, the harder it is. The by ne by necessary or necessarily, it becomes harder to find what you're looking for because just the entropy, if you will, the randomness of all the data will mean that some patterns repeat. And so, you know, if we typed a 500 word essay, the word hello might appear in there twice. Um, and it's no different when you're looking for specific data in a large game. And this is why larger games tend to be harder to nail down certain things. So say you're looking, you know, say you, your life is um, on a scale of zero to 100, not a percentage, just a, just a straight number. So if you zero, you're dead, 100, you got full life. Say you have full life and you search for 100. It's just, there's probably more than 100, there's more than one 100 stored in the memory of that game. So you will get more, way more than one result. And it's nice, so again, it's nice that information is granular like this because it helps us find exactly what we're looking for. But the downside is that the larger the data, that, the larger the memory set that you're working with, the more repetition of the pattern that you're looking for there is you know what I'm trying to say so um, we need to develop certain methods in order to deal with that we need to develop certain methods in order to narrow it down and we can certainly do that but um, sort of the 
what I would the conclusion of of this is basically that because of the way that programs allocate their memory is both a blessing and a curse for us when we're trying when we're coming at it from the perspective or in the context of cheat engine so as a program runs and it gets memory from the operating or it, yeah it gets memory from the operating system the OS pretty much gives it memory and then walks the other way for all intents and purposes we will say there are some exceptions I suppose but for our purposes once the program or application gets memory the OS will pretty much um, say that's great and and not bother you for that and not bother that program for that memory and at that point the program is free to store whatever it wants in that memory it doesn't matter um, it could be garbage it doesn't matter it's it's you know that's that program's memory so it's free to do whatever it wants with it and it can manipulate it as it sees fit and so again in the context of cheat engine this is kind of nice because we don't have to worry about messing with the operating system at all really um, it's just one less thing to worry about the downside here is that because there are no restrictions on what programs can store or put in the memory that they are allocated or that they allocate, they will store and put data in memory however they want within reason. Again, we talked a little bit about the data types and, and those standards are, are pretty much universal. But we can use the example of a numbered list um, to sort of illustrate what we mean. So it's very common for humans to um, organize information. So we'll say uh, point number one. Beer is tasty. Two, pretzels are tasty. And three, beer and pretzels are tasty pretty tasty now it's not re relevant whether you actually agree with these three statements or not but what what this is a logical way of organizing information and representing far more information with a number than that number actually represents so if we were to send this numbered list to somebody we could just say look at you know bullet point number two I disagree with and so you would be able to go back to this list and look at bullet point number two and say, well, what do they not agree with? Well, they don't agree with the fact that, that I, or my opinion, that pretzels are tasty. So computers are, can do very much the same thing um, in a much more generic way. So you may, be, you may find a number, but what does that number mean? Is that number referencing some other list or some other... Um, set of data in another place in memory you really have no idea so when you're searching for something like the player's health or the you know how many bullets i have in my machine gun you, you won't really run into this sort of scenario generally in that case 50 means you have 50 bullets and and, and very more often than not that is the case but it does raise the point that programs are free to store data however they want and it is left totally ambiguous and completely up to the discretion of the application in question to store data however they want and no one will tell them oh you can't do that as long as they have a way of storing it and they have a way of interpreting it into some sort of meaningful information to that application they can store it however they want and in that sense it becomes occasionally it becomes incredibly difficult with cheat engine to find the sort of information you're looking for not so much how many bullets are in my gun but um, maybe what level am I on or something of that nature you know very often than more often than not those sort of things are indexed so um, what level I am on it may not be three means the third level it may be something you know um, much different than that is what I will say and this sort of ambiguity um, is designed or is decided by the people who make the applications or the programs in question. And as we said, there's no standards for this. So they are free to sit down with a drawing board or a whiteboard um, and drink a case of beer and decide that 
I want to store data in a completely retarded way um, because we think it would be funny and it really doesn't matter because it's our application and as long as we know how we're storing data and the program can understand it and we can write those rules into the program, um, no one can tell us any different. And that certainly is the case or certainly can be the case. So again, there are times with Sheet Engine where what you see may not be exactly what you think you see. <clears throat> and I'll maybe make that a little clearer by saying that it is occasionally necessary to deduce or reverse engineer, if you prefer, the intent of the programmer who made the application that you're trying to cheat on. And for me, this is just on a side note, this is the most, this is one of the most fun parts for me about using Cheat Engine is when I find something similar to this numbered list here that, um, you know, again, not similar to the numbered list, but just when I find something that is not what I think it is, and there's some kind of indirection going on or some kind of internal mapping going on, and I have to sort of piece it together and, and figure it out, and you, it's not something that you can Google because maybe, you know, a hundred people on the planet have, you know, have gone so deep into the, you know, as deep into the memory of whatever application, um, you're messing with as you as you are and and found this thing and, and no one's written a blog post about it and if they have googlebot hasn't found it um and so you're pr really on your own and you have to think for yourself and think outside the box and 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 it's really to me it's definitely one of the most fun and rewarding parts of doing this sort of thing um hopefully it, you know you will get the same sort of feeling and to that end it's it's worth mentioning as well that Nothing stops programmers from trying to store data in really complex or messed up ways in order to fool potential cheaters or memory editors or hackers or people who use things like Cheat Engine. And in fact, some indie, I actually find that the indie games, occasionally I'll run across an indie game where they have the freedom, um, they're not being micromanaged or just they have the time, I guess is even more apt. Um, to sit down and write some really crazy memory encoding routines that make it very difficult to edit any values in the game. Um, and AAA titles are certainly have this as well. Um, I want to say that uh, Shogun 2 had some of this stuff. Total War Shogun, um, I think was the game. Um, that had some fairly crazy uh, memory checks and re cyclical redundancy things, and um, and so again, it's totally up to the to the application, the program in question, how they want to store and how they want to interpret their data. And for the simpler things like how many bullets and how many lives, generally, more often than not, you'll be all right and you'll be able to find that stuff, no problem. But when you start getting into some of the crazier things, um, you, you know, occasionally you will run across stuff where, you know, you can't help but think that the people who wrote this went out of their way to try and mess with people like you. And you, and sometimes you might be right. And that's fun. I think that's very fun. So if we return to the original question, what is memory? It's a somewhat lackluster answer. Memory is a place for programs to use as storage. It's simple and it's abstract, but it's very powerful. So we'll go to Wikipedia, ask about computer memory. In computing, memory refers to the physical devices used to store programs, sequences of instructions, or data, for example, program state information, on a temporary or permanent basis. The term primary memory is used for the information in physical systems which function at high speed as a distinction from second memory, so on and so forth. Um, all right, that's good enough for us, or that's good enough for now. So, again, the question of what memory is, is a simple and abstract one, but it's incredibly powerful. What is memory used for, I think, is the more pertinent question, because when you start getting into what memory is used for, you have to start asking yourself, well, how is it used in this way? And then when you start asking yourself, how is it used in this way, the ideas of data types, data sizes, and things like that, they all organically come up from that question. So that's how we're approaching it here, which is we started off with what is memory, 
and we said, well, before we answer that, we're going to talk about, let's talk about, you know, about how memory is used. That's a, obviously that was contrived, but um, it was a contrivance which I think is not totally out of line. In the event that you're bored with memory right now, it's worth saying that memory will be the cosmic string that binds everything together. It is hands down probably the most prevalent element in is going to be the most prevalent element in the series it'll probably be if not talked about directly it'll be referenced in every single episode or uh, video because what we're doing what cheat engine is doing is it's manipulating memory so it's absolutely critical that we have a intuitive understanding of memory um, and it's just there's no other way to say it than that on, uh, as a curiosity, or sort of as an A side, some some of you may be asking yourself if programs can request memory, and I'm just you could probably stop the video here, but I just feel like talking a little bit longer, and I find this topic really interesting. But if a program requests memory, and the operating system returns memory, and then programs have to give that memory back, what if the program just simply doesn't give the memory back, and that's a good question and it's referred to as a memory leak and before we read the whole article it's worth noting that memory leaks are in well-behaved programs they are accidental and but it doesn't mean that they have to be they anyone with even the most rudimentary training in the most in the simplest programming language can write a program that will eat up the system or the physical memory of any machine on the planet in probably less than a minute because it's because there is in most operating systems there's no mechanism that forces you to give the memory back um, the point at some point when a program chews up all the memory on a system the operating system will probably just kill that program and just shut it down and then it'll free all that memory up but there's no that's not a guarantee but um, back to the original question. A memory leak occurs when a computer program incorrectly manages memory allocations. A memory leak may happen when an object is in memory but cannot be accessed by the running code. That's not totally relevant. A memory leak has symptoms similar to a number of other problems and generally can only be diagnosed. Because they can exhaust available system memory as an application runs, memory leaks are often a cause or of or a contributing factor to software aging. A memory leak can diminish the performance of the computer by reducing the amount of available memory. In the worst case scenario, too much of the available memory may become allocated and all or part of the system or device stops working correctly, the application fails, or the system slows down unacceptably due to thrashing. So you can read the rest of this article, but basically memory management in and of itself is a very complicated topic, and in long complicated programs, it's really hard to keep track of how much of what you're allocating where and then freeing that memory appropriately and, and memory leaks do happen even to the best of programmers then maybe it's worth mentioning that there are ways to automate the management of memory it's referred to as garbage collection and I suppose there's probably a link somewhere in this article um, to garbage collection if we scroll down um, There we go. Garbage collection. Reference counting. Garbage collection. Garbage collection is a really long article. It's probably a whole lot of technical details. If you're interested in it, certainly start with this article and then work your way over to uh, garbage collection. But be warned that it's it's going to rapidly go from high level stuff into some pretty serious uh, memory techniques and, and um, uh, mechanisms of how memory management works. But to conclude this, as we said, it's imperative that we have a strong understanding of how memory works and its purposes, because that's where that's the home ground of Cheat Engine. That's where Cheat Engine lives. Is it lives in other processes' memory? That that's, and so that's where we will be spending our time, and so we will harp on memory until we understand it. 
as much as we need to. We won't harp on it unnecessarily, but we'll certainly harp on it a lot. And it will pay off dividends in the long run, bar, you know, hands down. And so with that, I believe we will, uh, we will finish this.